Well, thank you, Walter. Um, that was a very uh, embarrassing introduction. Um, I want to thank everyone here uh, for coming out on such a terrible day. Um, you know, we had to get in from all that solar radiation. Um, but I do want to thank uh, Walter and his staff for allowing me to come here to talk to you and to tell you a little bit about this curious case. Um, this is a talk that evolved out of um, some research I did <coughs> almost nine years ago now. And it was something I did in between finishing up as a employee of the Smithsonian and coming here to um, Wayne State. I had a little um, interim project there where I uh, switched horses and went from one museum to the other, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, I changed the title a little bit to Cultural Connections in Life and Death, The Curious Case. And um, I think that'll become also apparent as I go on uh, why I did that. Um, so in the first part, I want to talk a little bit about not only rekindling this research uh, with the objective of uh, producing a publication, uh, but I also want to talk a little bit about rekindling the network um, or how I got involved in what I did. When I use the term network, I use it both in a very general sense, a network, a net, um, a system of integration, a system of... Uh, relations, but I also kind of try to conjure ideas about networks um, as understood and, and talked about more recently by people like Bruno Latour and uh, John Law and that mom. Um, the network uh, emphasizes two things. The network approach emphasizes two things. Um, well, really three, obviously interconnections amongst things in time and space from the archaeological pers perspective. Um, but it also suggests that um, there's agency or force, power, however you want to look at it, outside of um, simply human relations, humans to humans. I'm talking about humans, institutions, um, objects um, as a integrated whole and something that has uh, takes on a life of its own, uh, but not just talking about um, humans and their interrelations, including a much larger system, um, including, in this case, uh, the deceased. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about, first about how I got involved, then I want to talk a little bit about um, some activities that occurred at the beginning of the last century, or uh, really two centuries ago now, and um, then I want to talk about the identity of these remains, these human remains from Cave Valley. And finally, some, some concluding observations. But part one is how I got involved in what I did. And I evoke the rekindling, um, both as it uh, brings to life the dead, in a sense. It emphasizes their power, their agency in the contemporary world, but tries to also evoke a complex set of networks that exist uh, today, but also uh, into the past. So I know that sounds kind of hokey and complex, but how about some more uh, details to set the tone? Um, it, the talk sort of begins at the point of repatriation, or the notion of repatriation, the idea of repatriation. And in between being at the Smithsonian and being here, um, I did a contract with the National Museum of the American Indian. And what they wanted to do was to kind of go beyond the scope of the law that was passed in 1989 that required the Smithsonian um, to essentially research, document, inventory, and consult with tribes about the return of human remains, Native American human remains, uh, for their possible return. Um, the NMAI, the National Museum of the American Indian, wanted to go beyond this scope. Um, they essentially wanted to 
um, take care of all the human remains that were in their museum um, and send them back whether they were uh, U.S. or otherwise. The, the laws that were passed only referred to uh, individuals um, that had, uh, whose custody was now under a U.S. institution. Uh, repatriation, pretty straightforward concept. Return uh, to one's country of origin. Generally think of this in terms of uh, prisoners being returned or uh, the remains of the deceased being returned. And this uh, case that I'm going to tell you about obviously refers to that. Uh, in addition to this notion of trying to kind of approach the thing from a network of both living deceased and other objects, landscapes, etc., et I also want to kind of evoke another notion here of uh, borrowing from uh, uh, the larger domain. Can you, can you go home uh, with apologies to... Uh, I guess Tom Wolfe and Bon Jovi and uh, several others who have used that notion. Um, but what about returning home when there's no one to return to? Or at least from some perspective, there's no one to return to. What about returning home when home is no longer there? Um, what about returning home and how do you return home when the cultural and historic fabric is torn apart, um, when the network is disrupted and new relations uh, are in place, new relations taking the place of the old ones and somewhat obviating um, the ease with which they might turn, uh, return home. Um, and of course, as I mentioned already, I want to talk about human remains as having their own sort of force, having agency um, as, as actors, um, as uh, um, forces within uh, networks evolving today amongst the living. Uh, so anyways, as I said before, I'll tell you how I got involved, how the remains got to D.C., who are they anyway, and can they in fact go home? Um, two important institutions in uh, kind of uh, throwing up a framework or a network here, uh, parts of the network involve two institutions. One at the very beginning of the story, because when the remains left um, Chihuahua, I'll get to that in a minute too, they went to directly to a place called the National Museum of Natural History, which at the time was called the National Museum, just simply the National Museum, part of the Smithsonian. And actually this building on top here, this sort of classical uh, pantheon-esque type place, um, is the place they actually went to. That was their port of call in um, North America. Uh, the building was one year old at the time. It was finished in 1910 and they arrived in 1911. Um, I use the kind of trope here of the human skeletal remains, um, the crania lined up like that very scientifically uh, to evoke the, the, the mission, the, the philosophy, the paradigm, uh, the model that's used there at the Natural History Museum, which is one of strong science. And um, human remains can be studied to understand all sorts of things about our common humanity and are very important in that respect. Um, the remains eventually ended up at this place down here, which is the National Museum of the American Indian. It's a very different sort of place and a place that um, is much more um, focused on the living, than in this case dead, much more focused on cultural studies, much more focused on um, ways that the museum can be part of a community, a living, breathing community in the, in the world today. So these are very two different places, but our, our remains <coughs> have history with both of them and um, uh, implicate both of them into, into this story. Um, I guess I might as well just go right to, the, to the, the, the fact of the matter is you might ask where these remains come from. And they come from a cliff in Chihuahua. 